At the United Nations Monday, an extraordinary debate between those rallying the world to intervene in Syria and the Syrian ambassador decrying what he considered interference. Anyone who perpetrates a violent armed act must be brought to justice. Justice being national justice and not YouTube justice. The people of Syria are asking for the rights that every human being is entitled to. And they are looking to this assembly to speak with one voice to support them in this endeavor. It's everybody's business. It's the business of humanity to make sure that everybody gets them. But yes, we do have to be intelligent and informed. And it is true that uh, unintelligent and uninformed or just risky intervention can be deeply counterproductive. So I'm, I'm much more um, leery of direct intervention, uh, even in the discourse of other societies, than some of my colleagues. I think we need to make sure that you are being helpful. After all, the point is to be helpful. And if it's true, which it is sometimes, that an intervention from outside is unhelpful, then don't do it. Kwame Anthony Appiah. <laughs> Professor Kwame Appiah, a philosopher advocating a school of thought he calls cosmopolitanism. It's an idea and a way of being that the highest circles in Washington decided to recognize last week when the professor was awarded a medal for his work. For his contributions to philosophy and the pursuit of truth in the contemporary world, Dr. Appiah's writing, within and beyond his academic discipline, sheds light on the idea of the individual in an era of globalization and evolving group identities. Today, Professor Kwame Appiah talks to Al Jazeera. Anthony Appiah, thanks so much for talking to Al Jazeera. It's a pleasure. Nice to be with you. You know you're described as something of a leader of a school of thought called cosmopolitanism. Let's start with a question of what is cosmopolitanism? Um, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, it's a very old tradition because the word cosmopolitan comes from a Greek phrase from the uh, fourth century BC, um, cosmopolitas, which means citizen of the world. So really, cosmopolitanism is a tradition of thought which tries to develop the metaphor of the idea that we're all citizens of the world. It's Do you a think that idea, though, is slightly different today, though, because of globalization? I mean, we're not living in the world of the four, fourth uh, century BC, are we? Absolutely. I mean, one of the funny things, I think, about cosmopolitanism is it was invented at a time when it was completely crazy because Diogenes, who was, who was the first person to say he was a cosmopolitan, uh, Diogenes just didn't know, he, he didn't know where most people in the world were, he didn't know anything about them. How, how could he think of them as his fellow citizens if he'd, he'd never seen a Chinaman? Uh, he didn't, didn't have a television. Uh, so um, nevertheless, he did have this idea that he was a, that everybody in the world, he didn't know who they were, but he, everybody in the world was somehow all connected and fellow citizens. So in the sense of the 21st century, when we talk about the world, as I've understood from some of your writings, you're convinced we're heading towards cosmopolitanism. What does that mean in terms of ethnicity, in terms of how one defines themselves in terms of race, religion, class, nationality? Okay, so I think the, the interesting thing about cosmopolitanism as, as a broad tradition is that it is, it does say we're all citizens of the world, but it doesn't it's, it has never followed that through, at least in the, in the high tradition of cosmopolitanism, to the idea that we should all therefore become citizens of one state. Cosmopolitans have characteristically said we're all, we should think we should care about one another, we're all fellow citizens of the world, but we're all different, and that's a good thing, it's not a bad thing. We're allowed to be different, and cosmopolitans, when they travel, are interested in the fact that when they go to other places, other places aren't like home. They, they think that's great. They're not the kind of universalist who says um, there's, a, there's a right answer for all of humanity and we'd like everywhere to look like, you know, uh, Dallas or, or New York or somewhere. But they want the world, they think it's fine that the world is full of difference. And so the answer about ethnicity and religion and, and, and so on is that um, cosmopolitans expect people to be different, they expect them to want to be different, and they think that's fine. Uh, and so they expect that 
uh, what they want is for people to think it's okay for other people to be different, but they're interesting and we care about them. I mean, one attitude you can have to different people is they're strange and you can be sort of hostile towards them. You can think, oh, I don't want to mix with them. That's not the cosmopolitan attitude. The cosmopolitan attitude is, well, there are all these people out there. They're different from me. I'm interested in them. I want to read their novels. I want to read their poems. I want to watch their movies. Uh, I'd like to visit them. I'd like them to visit us. Uh, and at the end of all these exchanges, we'll still be different and that's fine. Is that the way we're heading though? Let me throw out couple of scenarios. The first one that some people say is that may sound like a very rosy picture that cosmopolitans put out there, but the reality is some cultures are simply stronger than others. They've got more money or business or Hollywood or movies or literature behind them and they will stomp across other cultures making uniformity rather than the sort of respect for diversity that you're talking about. Yes. Is well, that where we're heading? Um, I think globalization of culture. The right globalization right. of culture, which me uh, and well, two things. Um, uh, yes, there's lots of uh, exchange going on, and, and it's asymmetrical. Uh, I was saying to some students yesterday here that uh, they've probably seen more American movies than Americans have seen movies from wherever it is they come from. Uh, that's and, and one of the points I want to make about that is that's sad for Americans. <laughs> Uh, that they don't have a more uh, cosmopolitan uh, movie experience. Um, look, the reason I don't have any problem, a cosmopolitan shouldn't have any problem with someone in Vietnam who says, uh, I've learned about this, this thing that the Americans do, which they call Hollywood, and I like it, right? Um, so we don't want people to stay in little cultural boxes. On the other hand, we, don't, we, we like the fact that there are differences, and so we want to make sure that if people want to maintain their differences, if they want freely to choose to live in different ways, to dress in different ways, it should be possible for them. Well, I understand that's what Anthony up here thinks should happen, yeah. but my question is, is that what's happening? How do you see the, the direction the world is going? Are we, are we going to that Rosalie cosmopolitan world? I think world, there's or? more... I think that the idea that there's one uh, sort of culture dominating the world, I think that's just not, not right. Um, um, there's a huge amount, and there's huge amounts of new cultural forms being generated, and they're not all being generated in Los Angeles, California, uh, or wherever you think Hollywood comes from. <laughs> um, uh, some, you know, uh, uh, Turkish movies, um, Hong Kong movies, Chinese movies increasingly, uh, in, in West Africa, Nigerian movies, so-called Nollywood, not Hollywood. Uh, these are all circulating uh, outside the places that, that produce them, as well as these uh, the, the, sort of the big uh, cultures that are stomping, uh, stomping around the world. Um, I wish that the big ones that were stomping around the world were more uh, leavened uh, more often in everybody's experience uh, by a difference. But I think that if you come, if you're a Turk or, or an Iranian, or Vietnamese, you're very unlikely to have a cultural experience that's mostly made up of American um, high, high or low culture. Uh, and you, you will know things about Turkish and Iranian and uh, Vietnamese music. Uh, you will know things about Turkish and Iranian and uh, Vietnamese um, sort of movie culture and television culture that are distinct and local. And the important thing about the kind of diversity that's, that uh, cosmopolitans like is that it is localized. It's the fact that there are different local places which are different from one another, and that's great. And I think localities remain local. I think uh, you know people like us who travel a lot can see that when we go to a new place, while it's true that there's a there's a Sheraton in you know in almost every capital in the world today, uh, when you step outside that Sheraton hotel you see a different world, and you see a different world not just in terms of uh, dress and so on, but in, in deeper ways. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think um, the kinds of difference there are changing, some forms of difference are going away, new forms of difference are being generated. I don't think everything's homogenizing. Let's take the other sort of nightmare scenario or bleak scenario that's emerging as a response to cosmopolitanism, and that is that perhaps some of those different or those new differences which are emerging are really ugly ones. A backlash against cosmopolitanism in the form of ultranationalism. Um, how do you see that, the rise of the far right, particularly in Europe? Are we going backwards, in a sense, as a, as a response to what could have emerged as 
globalization of culture. Yeah. No, I do think, I mean, I, everybody should worry uh, about um, the, the nasty side of, of that response to difference that occurs in, in many, many dimensions in many, many ways. And there are obviously many um, sources of this, but I think that uh, one of them is the asymmetries you talked about earlier, the fact that there are these very great differences in power uh, between people in different places, and that therefore the exchanges are so unequal. And this, this can happen, um, I think that what that leads to very often is a kind of uh, uh, negative reaction to difference rather than a recognition of it as interesting. And I think that what that means is that we have to work to um, develop relationships of respect across these differences, and that involves what, what I, the metaphor I use is the metaphor of conversation. It involves um, interacting with people across differences with no particular agenda. The point about a conversation, as opposed to a lecture uh, or, um, or a diplomatic meeting, <laughs> is that there isn't an agenda. We're just, you and I are talking to each other, we've got, we've got things to talk about, uh, the, the conversation can come and go. Is that practical though? I mean, let's put it in practical terms. In, in parts of Europe now where nationalism is rising, it's rising, we're told, because people are fearful of immigrants coming, taking over their country, taking over their jobs. Some European countries need immigrants in order to continue growing. So there's this constant dynamic of tension. How do you, I don't know, put an immigrant in a room with a neo-Nazi skinhead and say, go on, have a nice conversation, boys. You can sort it out. Right. Well, uh, and sort it out is what they'll do. Uh, they won't have a nice Maybe conversation. Maybe not through a nice conversation. <laughs> they won't do it through a nice conversation. No, I think that once it's got to that point, you have to work in other ways. You have to work around the people who are the most polarized. Between, that, uh, between the neo-Nazi and the immigrant, there's a chain of people who might be able to have conversations. The, the immigrant can have conversations with, with um, with more civilized natives of, of the wherever he's immigrated to, and, and maybe those more civilized natives are related to the, the neo-Nazi or, or see the neo-Nazi in context where they can have a conversation. So there, you can sort of be connected through chains. One of the things that um, you know, protects us from the worst effects of the kind of racism that we see developing in parts of Europe um, is, is that there are people on the native side who are very much against it and who are trying very hard to maintain the conversation, to maintain the respectful dialogue. Because once you get to the point where the, where the, the, the person who's at the, the wrong end of the stick, the person who's, who's not got the power, the immigrant in this case, um, has, can't trust anybody on the native side, then then you've got you've got There's disaster. a breakdown. You've got a breakdown. But you're going to have that, isn't that happening though? Well, I mean, you look at some countries in Europe. It's the far right that are getting elected. They're getting into power. They're yes. getting into office. You've got leaders who are accused of making Islamophobic and racist statements, and yet they keep getting elected somehow into office. Yeah. It makes you wonder. I mean, are we are we heading to rosy cosmopolitanism? No. I mean, look, cosmopolitanism is an ideal. Uh, so, so the fact that people aren't living up, uh, up to it isn't an argument against cosmopolitanism, it's an argument against those people. What we have to do is to think about the ways in which we can move people uh, out of these, uh, th these horribly uh, hostile uh, responses. I do think that, that Islam um, is a particular challenge because the, um, for two reasons. In, in Europe. One is that, um, an odd thing, uh, I think, but worth thinking about, which is that for many um, contemporary Europeans who are hostile to Islam, what they're hostile to Islam as is as religion, because they're highly secularized people and they don't like they don't like religion. The other religion of Europe, the other religions of Europe, Christianity, uh, Judaism, and, and, and the sort of Protestant religions, don't strike them as having the cultural power to uh, invade, as it were, the secular sphere. But Islam, uh, many Muslims in Europe are genuinely devout and serious about religion in a way that many Christians aren't anymore, many post-Christians aren't anymore. And so one, one, one of the problems and is, is that, is, is that it's a kind of um, hostility it's phrased in the name of Christianity, but actually what it is is a kind of hostility to religion. And I think that that's a, that's a big... The space of, 
of how much space religion yes, takes yes. up. Is so d- they think they don't want religion to take up that much they space think in public. Some people think that religion is taking up too much space in the eyes of others. This is normal. This is how exactly. religion is. Yes, so and, and it was normal in Europe uh, yeah, right. until relatively recently. And I think that um, we, we have that's a, so that's one problem. But the other problem, as I say, is that. Um, Muslims have reasons to be skeptical about the about the way in which they're represented, and so so um, so there's a difficulty in in persuading uh, people, migrant Muslims and now settled Muslims, some of them second third generation, persuading them that it's worth their while to try and explain themselves because they think they face a kind of invincible ignorance um, and a kind of hostility. And I would only say to those people that I think it's very important for them to keep trying, but very important uh, uh, for them to insist that they do want to have the conversation, uh, even though it's unpleasant. Uh, uh, the atmosphere is unpleasant. I think that it's very important on both sides. There are people on both sides, in other words, who can keep the conversation open. I think it's very important that they do so. Do you think the argument you're making will win in the end? I think that, um, the, the, look, when times are tough, the incent- and when, when there's competition over scarce resources, one thing that political leaders do, is, uh, and, political and groups do, is try and find some, uh, rallying, cry. some rallying cry. And they do it, us against them. by finding some them to make us into an us. Uh, we saw this, the most spectacular recent example, probably this was in the Balkans at the end of the Yugoslav Republic. Um, when things collapse, uh, when economies collapse, there's an incentive for what political scientists sometimes call ethnic entrepreneurs, leaders who to come in and use these boundaries to, to make an us in order to compete for the scarce resources. So uh, it's it, just a phase. You know, I, think, I think that in the long run, if we, if we don't, if, uh, please God, uh, Europe doesn't go into recession, and if, uh, we, uh, if the European economies sort of come back, I think that this kind of politics seems less attractive to people when they're basically secure and happy. Uh, I think those ent- ethnic entrepreneurs lose their appeal. So one thing, I, one thing I think does make a difference is 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 what's going on in the background economy. But I do think that it's also important for responsible political leadership to 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 argue against the these people who are stirring up uh, uh, these hostilities, um, even in times like this when it's difficult to do so. I think it's a very important. And when I say responsible leadership, I don't just mean politicians. I mean the novelists, the poets, the philosophers, the, the religious leaders, the, the, the filmmakers, everybody. Uh, it's our shared responsibility to create a climate in which these things don't happen. Let's uh, bring you from Europe to the Middle East and talk a little bit about this part of the world where, as you know, we've seen huge change over the last year or so. The Arab Spring, governments collapsing, new orders arising or still arising. Where do you think that's going? Is that a step towards cosmopolitanism? Um, there, it's, it's completely fascinating, and there are so many dimensions to this. But one thing that so I You're I still think scratching of, your head, too, like I, many I, people I, try I'm to figure out where head, this is all but, going. But like, like, all, like all academics, uh, I see in, in every event... Potential. Uh, the thing, potential, and also the things that I'm thinking about at the moment anyway. So I've been thinking recently a good deal about questions of honor and relationships of honor. And I do think that one of the things that you see, uh, particularly I think in Egypt, is this recovered sense of national pride because the Egyptian people can feel they did something, right? They, they can think, well, we sort of allowed ourselves to be bullied by these people for a long time, but look, we took the initiative back. And that sense of pride, I think, is a huge political resource. Now, everybody knows that it's dodgy that, um, that whether the Egyptian military will allow um, uh, democracy to develop in the ways that people like me would hope, that's, that's still, I think, an open question. But I think that this, this new sense of pride that you get in many places, the pride that, after all, and, and the confidence that's led people in Syria to face very, very serious danger and, and death and still keep going, not to be shut down, because they, they want to sen- have a sense of their initiative, that we, we, the people of Syria, are in charge. It is not the, it's not the elites who get to decide what happens here. We get to decide. I think that is a very powerful sentiment, and, uh, and uh, that excites me as, as a positive thing. 
One of the questions that, that comes up in the Arab Spring is the, is the question of outside interference stroke help. As a cosmopolitanism, how do you, in your mind, balance that equation between how involved or uninvolved outsiders should be? Do we have a responsibility to them? Well, well I, um, think, I think I think we very do. Interesting question, I think the it? fundamental responsibility, we all have a shared responsibility, cosmopolitans say. Mm -hmm. that, what does it mean to think of each other as fellow citizens? Well, one thing it means is that around the basic human rights, those are everybody's business. Uh, the, the, but then, the then you're getting into sovereignty, aren't you? And then the yes. other sort of nation uh, state concept, yes. which was supposed to be, it seems to be crumbling a little bit in no, the I Arab think, Spring. I think, I think it should be. How, how do you kind of. Uh, I, I, I do not think, uh, I have this argument very often with, with, with uh, Chinese. Uh, representatives of the government of China because I, because I it was one of the people that nominated Liu Xiaobo for the Nobel Peace Prize and I'm not allowed to go to China as a result. And they say you are uh, interfering in our internal affairs. I say, uh, look, I, I sent no Marines. I just made an argument. And the argument I made is an argument that I made as someone who cares about China. I'm not, interest, I'm not interested in freedom of expression in China because it's particularly good for me. I'm interested in it because I think it's good for China. I think Chinese, uh, the, the problems that the Chinese government faces, problems that they now face because they have riots, roughly one riot a week somewhere in China because they don't have a mechanism for responding to popular fit sentiment, uh, would be solved for them. And that would be better for everybody in China. And as a fellow citizen of theirs, of the world, I care that everybody in China has a good shot. So I absolutely think that we, we, we can, but Intervention has to be intelligent and informed, and a lot of outside intervention is deeply counterproductive. I think in the case of something like the Egyptian revolution, the, the, the uprising, um, now it's sort of up to them. I mean, the fact that they've recovered initiative, and I think it would be counterproductive to do too much, uh, even talking from the outside. Right now, they're having a conversation. They're having a conversation that they weren't having and that they need to have. Let's leave them to it. If they ask us in, if they ask our help, if they ask our advice, whoever we are, well, of course, we should give it to them as fellow citizens of the world. But right now, there's a business for, for Egyptian citizens, citizens of Egypt, to be working on, which we, and actually your network, help them, help them to do. But now I think this is a moment for them to, to focus on it for themselves. When you were talking about China, they're really intrigued to know what do you say in response then to those who might counter your argument and say, well, thank you very much for your good intentions, but so the argument goes, you as the outsider, you don't really know, you may intend to help, but you don't really understand the local situation that's going on in Syria, China, or wherever. You, by intervening, you may inadvertently be actually making things a lot worse. And you know, there are those who say that, look, if China had followed uh, the example of other post-communist countries, they might be today in a much worse off economic situation if they'd rushed into yes. massive rapid change. I mean, no, how, look, how do you, all I'm saying is how do you respond to that well, sort of I, argument? I, uh, as a, yeah, as I said, it, 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 outsiders have to be uh, informed and intelligent in their But who decides if they're informed um, or in, you, intelligent? Well, let, so let me give you a, an example. Why do I support Liu Xiaobo? Because he was the president of the independent Chinese Penn Center and I'm the president of the Penn American Center in New York. We spend a lot of time talking to them about what their analysis. We are writer to writer, intellectual to intellectual. And so our view about China isn't, isn't just an outsider's view. We're endorsing the view of someone inside China who's currently in prison for 11 years for saying what he thinks. Um, but it isn't as if we have waived some standard of, of, uh, 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 of politics that's completely external to China. As a matter of fact, I think the most fundamental criticism we can make just from the point of view of legality of what happened to Liu Xiaobo is that it's inconsistent with the Chinese constitution to do to him what they've done to him. And it's, it's inconsistent with obligations that the Chinese have accepted in, under international law. So the very fact that the, there are these human rights means that, that it's everybody's business. It's the business of humanity to make sure that everybody gets them. But yes, we do have to be intelligent and informed. And it is true that uh, unintelligent and uninformed or just risky intervention can be deeply counterproductive. So I'm, I'm much more um, leery of direct intervention uh, even in the discourse of other societies than some of my colleagues. I think you need to make sure that you are being helpful. After all, the point is to be helpful. 
And if it's true, which it is sometimes, that an intervention from outside is unhelpful, then don't do it, because that shows that you care about these people. This has been an absolutely fascinating conversation, but unfortunately, we are going to have to leave it there for now. Anthony Appiah, thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much.